So it's, yeah, it's great to be here and great to, um, to start the, the Avenue Summer Psalms. It's the Summer Psalms Avenue, that means it must be summer, um, although from what I've heard of the weather and what we've experienced in this last week, perhaps it doesn't feel like that. Um, wait for those sheets to be given out. <coughs> So, um, yes, as you've, as you've heard, uh, we've been living in Nigeria, uh, in Jos, for the last 15 months. Um, and so we've had a lot of things to get used to, things that are different. Uh, and one of the things we're still trying to work to getting used to is, is the church services. Um, usually they range from two to three hours, um, and the sermon lasts about an hour. So um, you'll be pleased to hear that this morning... I'm going to do my best to keep the sermon under one hour. Um, although, I guess, it did seem funny when I wrote this, but since having our all-age slot that took longer than planned, we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, so as Richard said, um, the psalm that we're looking at today is the shortest psalm uh, in the Bible um, and the shortest chapter in the Bible. So hopefully that will help us to keep to time and probably I've got time to, to read it again. So... Um, It's Psalm 117. It says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Short and sweet, I hope you agree. So what we want to do is take some time to unpack uh, these verses and see what it tells us about God and, and how we should respond um, so we're going to try and look at it in, in three parts. Uh, so the first one, kind of thinking, what, what are we being encouraged to do? Um, secondly, trying to understand why are, we be, we, why are we having this, being encouraged to do this? And then lastly, um, who is this instruction for and, and what does that mean for us? So the first part... Um, Oh, I've given a. So, in the Psalms, uh, there's a common kind of literary technique um, that they used where they kind of make a point in one line and then in the next line repeat it uh, to give it more emphasis. And you see it in the Psalms and Proverbs and other places. And, and this is what happens here in verse one. The psalmist is calling uh, the people to praise the Lord in the first line and then in the next line to extol him. Um, and, and as Anne did, I thought, well, what do these words actually mean? So I, I googled them. And so praise actually turn, uh, uh, is, occurs over 200 times in the Bible, um, and 100 of those times in the Psalms. Uh, extol is, is less common, um, but uh, appears about 25 times. So yeah, so what, what do they mean? So I, I googled, or I find it strange that in Nigeria they call it goggled. So I goggled um, what, uh, what, what those words were. Uh, so praise, what does that mean? So my definition that, that, that came up when I looked was to express respect and gratitude to someone. And, and so in the case of this uh, psalm, that someone is, is God. Um, and then, so what does extol mean? So to extol means to praise enthusiastically or to praise highly. So I thought, let's maybe look up what does enthusiastically mean? It says, in a way that shows intense and eager enjoyment, interest or approval. Uh, And somewhere else it said um, that if you're enthusiastic about something, you show how much you like it or enjoy it by the way you behave and talk. So if we kind of put all those definitions and words together, um, what does this verse 1 tell us? Verse 1 is calling us to show, by the way we act and talk, how intensely we think highly of God and how eagerly thankful we are to Him. Now, when I kind of read that or hear that kind of definition, it challenges me quite a lot. Is is that something that I do? Um, I would think that I praise God when I'm, I'm singing worship songs, 
But does that spill over into the way that I talk and behave? Is there an intensity and an eagerness to the way I demonstrate that? Is my praise of God evident in my everyday life? How do we praise and extol God? Now, there's, there's lots of um, things that affect how we demonstrate praise. Um, I'm sure personality has something to do with it. Uh, personally, being an introvert, I don't really show a lot of my feelings very obviously. I, I don't really do excitement. Um, Lisa, my wife, sometimes uh, equates me to Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh uh, when it says, good morning, if indeed it is a good morning. Um, but, but being an introvert is not an excuse for, for not demonstrating praise. Um, and our ways of expressing ourselves are different in different cultures. Um, so Nigerian culture is, is much more demonstrative and exuberant than the reserved English culture. Um, you might see some people on the streets and you, they're having some interaction and you think they're about to have, start having a fight. But actually, they're just sharing a story or discussing uh, politics or the football. Um, and this exuberance is shown in the churches to a degree. Um, in general, they're a bit more lively um, and energetic than in the UK. Um, but praise is more than just energetic worship and, and singing and dancing. One of the things I've appreciated uh, working in Nigeria is the way that spiritual things are much more a part of everyday conversation uh, wherever you are. Um, I've noticed this working as a physio. People often speak out their praise and thanks to God when they make improvements and even when they don't. Uh, and sometimes when working, um, I'd have to treat patients that I wasn't really sure what I was doing. So I kind of gave it a go. Uh, but amazingly, when they came back, they got better. So at those times, I was really pleased to, uh, to openly and genuinely say, praise God, because it was nothing that I did that made them better, I didn't think. So we can praise um, in different ways. We can show our praise in different ways. And sometimes that might make us feel uncomfortable or a bit out of place. I'm always challenged by the way that in Samuel 2, chapter 6, David celebrated and praised God when the Ark of the Covenant was returning to Jerusalem. He danced wildly with abandon, not caring what others thought of him. And when he was challenged by, about this by Michal, the daughter of Saul, he said, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and will be humiliated in my own eyes. David didn't care what anyone thought of him when he was praising God. He was just so full of praise that he just had to let it out however he could. So the challenge for us is to show, by the way we act and talk, how intensely we respect and are thankful to God. How do we demonstrate and communicate that to the people around us? Or also, do we demonstrate and communicate that to the people around us? What are the things that stop you and me from demonstrating our praise to God in the way that we act and talk? Are you worried about what other people might say or think? Or is giving thanks and praise to God just not really something that you think about in the busyness of life? How can you demonstrate your praise to God more in whatever way works for you without giving yourself excuses not to do it, and being willing to be more undignified because your thankfulness to God is just overflowing. Hopefully, the, the second point that we're going to look at um, might help us a bit with knowing how we can do that. So the psalm starts by giving us uh, an exhortation to, to praise and extol the Lord. And there seems to be an unwritten why that comes next, because the psalmist then goes on to give the reasons. Why should we praise and extol the Lord? For great is his love toward us, 
and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. So let's look at these two reasons. So great is his love. I often find it emotional when I see love expressed. If I hear a story or watch the TV or a film and someone goes out of their way to help someone else or gives up something they want for the sake of someone else or if they sacrifice themselves for someone they love. It is at those times that it has been reported uh, that there may have been a little tear in my eye, Uh, to be honest, sometimes quite a bit more than that. We all like to hear stories of love and, and how that plays out in other people's lives. Love connects to our hearts and it's something we all need and seeing it in action makes us feel good. But the love that this psalm is talking about, this great love, is not just for some random person in the news or a character on the TV or film. This psalm says that God's great love is for us, is for you, and it's for me. Given the feelings that, um, em- and emotions that we have when we see the effects of love in the world around us, how much more should our feelings and emotions be to know that love's, God's great love is for us? In John 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, uh, to lay down his life, for one's friends. And that's what Jesus did for us. And it says in in John 3.16 that, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God gave Jesus for all of us. Jesus gave up his life for all of us. How should that make us feel? And and what can we do with that feeling so that it overflows into praise that is evident in the way we act and talk? Not long long after we arrived in Nigeria, um, I joined a Bible study group um, doing a study called Wholehearted Leadership. Uh, And one of the things it talked about was um, how in wholehearted leadership requires you to know the love that God has for you so that you can demonstrate it to the people you are leading. Uh, It encouraged us to think of a time when we really felt God's love um, to us and to use that in our role as a leader. Uh, For me, I remember the time when our second son, Emmanuel, was born extremely prematurely and only lived for a couple of hours. The love that we felt from God through the support and kindness of friends, family and our Avenue Church family was so amazing that it remains a great source of strength and power that enables me to share love with other people. As much as we would rather have not had things happen as they did, the experience of God being with us and loving us is something that when I think about it really causes me to want to praise God and demonstrate it to others. So how have you experienced God's love in your life? How has God used people around you to show God's love for you? And how can you use that experience to help you to demonstrate your gratitude to God, to the people around you? So God's great love is one reason for us to praise God enthusiastically. The second reason is that The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. And having these two things is important. Great love is only really as good as how much you can rely on it. If that love is here today and gone tomorrow, if there's a chance that you could fall out of that love, then it's not so much of a thing to shout about. Faithfulness seems to be something that is hard to come by these days. But it's something that is valued by people. When we buy a car or other things, we want to know they will be reliable. We want to know if it will last. Products are sold with warranties and guarantees that try to give us the confidence to buy and potentially spend more money because they'll stand the test of time. 
And we want to know that we can trust people and those who communicate with us as well. Uh, when you think about Nigeria, uh, what are your thoughts? Or if you had an email from a Nigerian prince, what would your thoughts be? Sadly, Nigeria has a reputation for uh, internet scams and, and scams in general, and, and it's not good uh, for, the, for the country. People find it difficult to trust. Also, um, the general elections are coming up here in this country, um, and there's a lot of talk about how faithful the different parties will be. Um, will they do what they say? Um, are they going to do a U-turn? Can we trust them? Reliability or faithfulness is, is important to all of us. We want to know what we can expect. We want to know who we can trust and if we can rely on them. So how does God compare to these examples? The psalm says God is faithful. He can be trusted, but for how long? The psalm tells us that his faithfulness lasts or endures forever. There's not an end to the warranty period. There's a lifetime guarantee. In fact, more than that, even after your death, the guarantee still stands. Throughout the Bible, we see God keeping his promises and coming through with the claims he makes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can be trusted and relied upon. No scams, no U-turns, no disappointments. God does what he says. He loves like he says, and that won't change. The great love that God has for us won't change ever. No matter what happens, no matter what we do, God loves us greatly. So when you think of this great love that God has for us and the faithfulness and reliability of our God, how does that make you feel? A love so great that Jesus would lay down his life for us. A love so reliable that it has never changed and will never change. I don't know about you, but that makes me feel pretty good. So what do we do with that feeling? What, what should that lead us to do? Well, hopefully that overflows into praise, but more than that as well. The third point I want to look at is who is this psalm written to? Because hopefully that will help us to know what we can do uh, with the way the psalm makes us feel. The psalmist says, praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. So this psalm was originally written for the Israelites, for Jewish people. But it's clear that its message is not just limited to them. Uh, the scope of the psalm is far wider. Everybody is encompassed. Uh, the Apostle Paul quotes this psalm in Romans 15 verse 11 when he's encouraging unity in the believers. He's making the point that the gospel message is for the Gentiles as well as the Jews. The message is for everyone. However, elsewhere in Romans, Paul asks a good question. How will people hear about the message of God's love and faithfulness unless someone tells them? I was interested to read the message version of these verses in Romans, uh, chapter 10, 14 to 15, and how it brings out the importance of God's faithfulness. It says, but how can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? And how can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it. So, in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, um, Jesus sends his disciples to all the nations. And we are called to do the same. We are called to share the gospel message with all peoples. And part of that message is laid out in Psalm 117. We are to share with all nations and peoples the great love and faithfulness of God. The feelings that we get when we think of that great love that God has for us, 
the feeling we get when we realize how reliable and faithful God is. These should overflow from us and should motivate us to tell others about it. We should want to be part of it. SIM, the, the mission organization we serve with, has as the first line of its mission and purpose, the first line is convinced that no one should live and die without hearing God's good news. It then goes on to say that the work that SIM does, the work that it comes from, being compelled by God's great love and empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's God's great love that compels us to share the good news with those who have not heard it. And this psalm tells us of God's great love and faithfulness. When reading this psalm, we can't avoid the need to share this with the people around us and possibly people further afield too. So what is God prompting you to do through reading this psalm? Perhaps, if you're not a Christian, this is the first time that you're realizing the extent of God's love for you and how much you can rely on him. If you want to know more, then please do speak to Richard or one of the elders or a, or a Christian friend here. We would love for you to find out more. Perhaps for others of you, uh, this psalm is a much-needed reminder of the great love that God has for you personally. Something which has not felt obvious recently. Or perhaps it reassures you that God is actually faithful. That, although it feels difficult to think it at the moment, God will come through on his promises. Whatever has stood out to you from this psalm, we are called to express that. We're called to express how we feel about God and, and what we know about God. We are called to express that to God and to those around us. How can you do that? Who will you speak to this week about how thankful you are to God? How will you behave that shows that thankfulness? Can you be the person that stands out at work or school because you are thankful to God despite the frustrations that you experience? Can you be the person who shares about and demonstrates in your life something of God's faithfulness in the way that you behave? Can you do this with the people you meet, your next door neighbor? Or perhaps God is calling you to step out a bit further and tell people further afield or overseas about God's love and faithfulness. Whatever God is saying to you, there is a call to action. We need to express our praise in some way. So we'll take some time now to reflect on this psalm, to allow us to react. We're going to have a time of open prayer later um, during the sung worship. Um, and this will be a chance for you to speak out your thanks and praise to God. But before that, let's each take a short time to quietly reflect and consider in what ways you can live out this psalm in the coming days. So, whatever you do this week, this psalm doesn't really leave us the option of inaction. The psalm starts with the instruction to praise the Lord. And it ends with a call to praise the Lord. So let's do that now. Um, Anne will come and explain what we're going to do next. But let's pray.
praise the Lord together. Um, 